Hello, everyone. Welcome back to class. Uh, we are jumping into a new unit this week. I hope you all had a great weekend, and I hope you all are excited to study uh, a new Asian philosophy. And this one is one of my personal favorites. Um, it's one that I have a good deal of experience with, and it's one that I've taught in some of my other classes as well, uh, including Introduction of Philosophy. So I'm really excited to share it with you today. The Asian perspective that we're looking at today is going to be Taoism, uh, which you'll see uh, has a few different similarities with Confucianism and Buddhism, uh, and some of its core ideas and values have come to deeply inform Asian culture. So, let's get started. As always, I'm going to start with a history of Taoism, then we're going to look at some of the basic teachings, and finally, I'm going to give you an overview of the primary text that we're going to look at next week. First, the history. Taoism, like pretty much everything else that we're studying in this class, uh, is an ancient Eastern philosophy, or you might call it a religion, again, which originated in China around the same time as Confucianism, possibly based on a historical figure known as Lao Tzu. So, Taoism and Confucianism are kind of uh, arising at the same time in China, and I think both of them are being formulated as a response to this very chaotic social and political time that the Chinese people are facing in the Warring States period, which, as we looked at when we looked at uh, Confucianism, um, occurred after the peaceful and pro prosperous Zhou dynasty. Now, the central figure of Taoism, Lao Tzu, is, uh, there isn't a consensus on whether or not this is a real, actual historical figure, whether or not they actually wrote uh, the Tao Te Ching, which we're going to be looking at, um, and what their role was in Chinese society. According to some legends, uh, some scholars think that Lao Tzu, uh, literally the old master, uh, was a real historical person. Uh, he may have had a slightly different name, um, but according to legend, he was somebody who served as a royal archivist for the Zhou dynasty. Uh, he wrote the Tao Te Ching before uh, the Warring States period really broke out, um, but, you know, there was kind of some of that tension and, and insecurity in the air. Um, and supposedly he was a contemporary of Confucius, even impressing Confucius on one instance uh, when they actually had a conversation with one another. So some people think uh, Lao Tzu, who is credited as writing the Tao Te Ching, uh, was actually a real historical person who lived and died, who had students. However, uh, there are some scholars who disagree with this view. Others actually question the existence of such a person, of uh, Lao Tzu, uh, claiming that the Tao Te Ching was actually written by a group of people, uh, a group of unknown authors during the Warring States period uh, that may or may not have been influenced by Confucius and some other uh, old sages during this time. So even though we credit uh, Lao Tzu with writing the Tao Te Ching, uh, there is some scholarly debate about who this person actually was, uh, what their relationship is uh, to Taoism and its development, and whether or not they uh, were actually somebody who worked in the royal one of the royal courts of the Zhou dynasty. In any case, uh, what is not debatable is that this philosophy of life, this religion, uh, originated around the same time that Confucianism did. So uh, it's unsurprising that there would be some cross-pollination between these two different philosophies or religions. And that's something that we actually see uh, if we look through history uh, at the development of Taoism and Confucianism, and Confucianism and their impact on China. Again, like Confucianism, Taoism uh, was influenced... Uh, by this Warring States period that was starting to break out during this time. Again, this was a time of uh, social and political chaos where power was being fought over by local warlords, 
the uh, average Chinese person was experiencing a lot of insecurity, instability, fear surrounding this violence, uh, lack of economic and familial security. Uh, and we see how this time period in human history affected Taoism, the Tao Te Ching, and the development of Taoism moving forward. I believe, along with Alan Watts, that Taoism was influenced by this period. And if we actually look at some of the basic teachings of Taoism, which we're going to get to in a little bit, we can actually kind of seeing those, see those influences uh, bubble up a little bit. In any case, uh, if we look at Chinese history more specifically and uh, Asian history more generally, what we do see is that Taoism, Confucianism, and Buddhism greatly influenced the development of Chinese culture, politics, philosophy, and actually science um, during the time in which Taoism and Confucianism uh, were being developed, um, we did see a, a scientific progression, uh, invention, um, explosions of innovation and knowledge. So all of these philosophies that we've been looking at in this class have deeply informed the development of East Asian society, and we still see uh, those influences today. Taoism today is actually practiced across the globe, South America, North America, Asia, Africa, Europe, um, but it is most popular in East Asia, I believe. Um, even though it has strongly influenced the development of East Asian society, uh, in the modern era, more contemporarily, uh, Taoism has also come to influence Western society as well. Uh, including New Age spirituality, American transcendentalism, uh, which was kind of pioneered by Thoreau, uh, and martial arts in the West. Uh, what we see in the United States today, for example, is that people who follow kind of New Age spirituality, where all is one, or American transcendentalism, which puts forth the view that there is a spark of the divine in everything, that these ideas can be traced back somewhat uh, to Taoism uh, in uh, perhaps not so, uh, what would the word be? Um, not, not exactly put in that language, um, but these ideas do come from Taoism and from Hinduism as well, which we're looking at in this class. In any case, Taoism has kind of left its mark on both the East and the West. And so I think it's a really cool philosophy to study because uh, not only has it influenced the development of society uh, in the United States and in China, uh, but also I think it might be a good solution to some of the ills and anxieties that we are facing today. But you're gonna have to be the judge of that as we go through some of the basic teachings of this view. Like Buddhism, Taoism is uh, an Eastern philosophy that encourages us to reconceptualize our place in the cosmos and our relationship to the operations of the universe. More specifically, what Taoism encourages us to do is to try to harmonize ourselves with how the universe is flowing, how the universe is working harmonizing ourselves with the operations of the universe so that we can achieve a peace, a security, a flourishing life that we wouldn't be able to achieve otherwise. In essence, what Taoism says is that we should basically go with the flow. Go with how the universe is working and operating. This is kind of a mystical view. Um, it doesn't sound so practical right now, but as we kind of get into the specifics of Taoism, I think you'll see the simplicity and the wisdom behind this kind of view. In any case, what Taoists try to encourage people to do is not try to plan out every facet of their lives, not try to control everything, not try to 
force things to happen or force the universe to go a certain way, but rather to kind of accept the universe for what it is, roll with the punches, kind of let things slide off of you, don't hang on to anything, uh, don't become attached to anything. In this way, it's kind of similar to Buddhism, but rather just acting according to our desires, our instincts, and not trying to fight against what is happening to us and around us. That is, acting according to our own natures without consciously or intentionally trying to make anything happen. And so you can see, uh, what Taoism encourages is something that is kind of very strange to how we would normally encourage people to live their lives in Western society. We tell people in the United States, for example, to be smart, plan ahead, do this, do that. You should be thinking about all these things. You should be questioning these things. You should be controlling things and increasing your own power. Taoism is the exact opposite of that. Okay. It's going to say no. Don't chase after materiality. Don't try to control the universe or control other people. Just become more comfortable and more willing to accept what is. And if you can learn how things work, by going with the flow, by letting processes happen and not fighting against them, you're actually going to be able to use those movements of energy or those operations of the universe to great effect. In Taoism, flexibility, softness, trust in the operations of the universe, in yourself and your fellow man, and detachment is key. That is, what the Taoists are trying to get us to do is to reconcile ourselves with the universe. We can compare this to, in Western philosophy, Soren Kierkegaard's Night of Faith uh, in his book, Fear and Trembling. According to Soren Kierkegaard, the Knight of Faith, the true Christian, is somebody who accepts the way that the world is, trusts in God's plan, and because they have this trust and this faith, they are granted a security and a happiness and a flourishing that we wouldn't be able to cultivate if we were trying to question and control everything. Rather, according to Kierkegaard, if we can reconcile ourselves to what the universe is doing, not endlessly complain about it, not try to fight it, not try to control it, if we accept the way that it is, and if we trust in God's plan, we're going to be able to, in some sense, regain the entire universe and be able to authentically live in a way that we weren't able to before. Taoism is encouraging something similar here. Although it's not going to have the same conception of God exactly as Christianity is, it's going to say, yeah, if you want to live a flourishing life, detach yourselves from this stuff. Don't get so invested in your plans and your uh, future goals and making money. Don't get invested in that stuff. But be flexible. Be able to roll with the punches that the universe throws at you. Like a tree in the wintertime that bends when the snow lands on it and piles up on it and therefore does not break and will eventually come back once the snow leaves to its upright position, this is how we are supposed to be, according to Taoism. Imagine a tree instead that would be rigid and unchanging and is trying to impose its will on, on the snow. Well, that tree is going to snap and break. Whereas if we're flexible, if we are soft with things, if we're not trying to manhandle things in metal, we're going to be a lot better off in our lives. This is what Lao Tzu is pushing us towards. Thus, in contrast to a lot of Western philosophies, especially Christianity, Taoism does not see human nature as bad or or lacking, or evil. Nor does Taoism see the universe as bad, or lacking, or in need of repair. 
Think about what Christianity espouses. It's going to say something like, on account of Adam and Eve's uh, disobedience to God in the Garden of Eden, humankind has fallen, and we are no longer in right relationship with God. Our default state is antithetical to the will of God. We are sinful. Uh, if we're not careful, we will be an instrument of Satan. We're bad. There's something about our nature that has become corrupted. Taoism is going to say the opposite. It's going to say, no, there's nothing wrong with you. Okay? There's nothing wrong with the way nature is. Nature is not filled with this thing called sin. Rather, in some sense, everything is kind of the way that it ought to be. Except for when humans meddle in things. But we're going to get to that later. Rather, humans, like the universe are the way that they ought to be. What humans are doing wrong is they're not operating according to their human nature. They're endlessly trying to plan, which is, and meddle in things, which is messing things up. Thus, Taoism is going to have a different view on the nature of the universe and human nature compared to Christianity or even Buddhism, which is going to say that your life is inherently suffering, and the only way to escape that is by following this Buddhist path out of this cycle. This cycle is bad, but this is how the universe works. No, a Taoism is going to say, the universe is not bad. It's a matter of perspective, ultimately. If something looks bad or ugly to you, well, it's because you have allowed yourself to become uh, drowned in distinction, in particularity. Rather, what we should recognize is that everything is actually part of one giant dynamic process that is beautiful and unfolding through time. Here you can kind of see how Taoism has influenced Western transcendentalism and New Age philosophy. And so Alan Watts says in his book, The Watercourse Way, which I'm going to read a few passages out of today. The principle is that if everything is allowed to go its own way, the harmony of the universe will be established. Since every process in the world can do its own thing only in relation to all others. So, Taoism is trying to get us back to a place where we become harmonized with what everything else is doing. If everything is just following its own nature and being allowed to do what it's going to do, everything is going to be working properly. Everything is going to be in its proper place. And so now I'd like to kind of transition into talking about Taoist metaphysics. Remember, metaphysics is the domain of philosophy concerned with what is the universe made of and how does the universe work? We've looked at already uh, Confucian metaphysics, which wasn't very deep because it's more of a social political philosophy. We've looked at Buddhism, which prescribes this reincarnation metaphysics, right? In which we're all caught in this cycle that we uh, should try to escape if we want to uh, no longer suffer. And we've also looked at Hindu metaphysics, which, according to one view, says that basically we are all. Uh, parts of the universe coming to understand itself. Well, Taoist metaphysics is going to be equally kind of mystical um, and strange compared to how we understand things in Western society. The first thing that you need to know about Taoism, and this is something that you can kind of apply to a lot of Asian philosophies in general, is this idea of polarity which is symbolized by the concept of yin and yang. This symbol, which I know you've seen before, yin and yang, represents the polarity of the universe in which all things exist in relation to one another. The basic idea is that light cannot exist without dark, heavy cannot exist without light, uh, rough cannot exist without soft, High and low exist in relation to one another. Left and right exist in relation to one another. What we call good and evil 
exist in relation to one another. And these things cannot be separ separated from one another. Okay? Although different elements of existence participate in one end of the polarity more than others, you need both sides. You need, you need both polar elements in order for things to exist, in order for things to make sense, in order for us to understand things at all. So, the polar elements of phenomena, of events, of things, of people, cannot exist without each other. And Alan Watts talks about this in this book, The Watercourse Way, Dow The Watercourse Way on pages 19 and 20, in 22 to 23, which I'd like to just now read for you all. This is the beginning of chapter two. At the very roots of Chinese thinking and feeling, there lies the principle of polarity, which is not to be confused with the ideas of opposition or conflict. In the metaphors of other cultures, light is at war with darkness, life with death, good with evil, and the positive with the negative. And thus, an idealism to cultivate the former, light, good, and be rid of the latter, dark, evil. This flourishes throughout much of the world. To the traditional way of Chinese thinking, however, this is as incomprehensible as an electric current without both positive and negative poles. For polarity is the principle that plus and minus, north and south, are different aspects of one and the same system, and that the disappearance of either one of them would be the disappearance of the system. So, what Taoism is going to tell us is that actually everything in the universe is part of one interconnected, interlocking, dynamic process. We can oversimplify this by saying all is one. And so you can't get rid of dark without getting rid of light. You can't get rid of north without getting rid of south. You can't get rid of plus without getting rid of minus. All of these things are part of the same underlying thing. That's what this concept of polarity is trying to get across. Watts continues. The key to the relationship between yang and yin is called hisheng sheng, mutual arising or inseparability. As Lao Tzu puts it, when everyone knows beauty as beautiful, there is already ugliness. When everyone knows good as goodness, there is already evil. To be and not to be arise mutually. Difficult and easy are mutually realized. Long and short are mutually contrasted. High and low are mutually posited. Before and after are in mutual sequence. They are thus like the different but inseparable sides of a coin, the poles of a magnet, or pulse, an interval in any vibration. There is never the ultimate possibility that either one will win over the other, for they are more like lovers wrestling than enemies fighting. It is thus of interest that a common Chinese expression for sexual intercourse is hua chen, the flowery combat in which, of course, there is no wish in either partner to annihilate the other. But it is difficult in our Western logic to see that being and non-being are mutually generative and mutually supportive, for it is the great and imaginary terror of Western man that nothingness will be the permanent end of the universe. We do not easily grasp the point that the void is creative, and that being comes from non-being as sound from silence and light from space. Here again, another uh, quotation from the Tao Te Ching. Thirty spokes unite at the wheel's hub. It is the center hole that makes it useful. Shape clay into a vessel. It is the space within that makes it useful. Cut out doors and windows for a room. It is the holes which make it useful. Therefore, profit comes from what is there, usefulness from what is not there. So, the general idea is that everything is part of one underlying substance or process, we might say. Even though uh, we can recognize distinction in things, we can recognize good and evil, light and dark, left and right, north and south, all of these 
elements or aspects are part of the same underlying thing. And they're inseparable. Thus, Taoism is informed by the idea that the universe is one. There are no firm boundaries or distinctions between things, events, or processes. Everything is actually part of the same underlying thing. What Taoism is going to call the Tao or the way. For example, the heavens only exist in relation to earth. Humans uh, exist in relation to non-humans. Organic only exist in relation to inorganic things. Being to non-being. It doesn't make sense to talk about humans if there weren't things in the universe that were non-humans. Right? And we make distinctions between all these different kinds of things in Western society, right? We say, uh, this is a little uh, metallic thing. Um, this is a coffee mug, right? This is a book. And we say that all these things are different from one another in Western society, that they have their own unique essence to them or existence. But this is not how Taoism sees the universe. Rather, this metal thing, the mug, the book, all of these things are just particular manifestations of the same underlying thing. They're all part of or participate in the same underlying thing. So this book ultimately is not different than this mug. They're part of the same thing ultimately. They, they're, they are equivalent in some respect. That is why in Taoism uh, and in Chinese philosophy, uh, the thinkers are going to say everything is mutually arising. All things and events are coming into exist are coming into existence. They are existing at the same time, informing each other, and uh, they are interdependent and interconnected with each other. Okay. This is what is meant by the phrase sheng sheng, mutually arising. Ultimately, there are no firm distinctions between things. Everything arises out of the Tao, the same underlying dynamic process. What if you were going to import Western language into Taoism, you might call God. But again, they're going to conceptualize, the Taoists are going to conceptualize God a little bit differently. Everything is a part of the Tao at the end of the day. The Tao, according to Alan Watts, is the course, the flow, the drift, or the process of nature. There is no stepping outside of it because the Tao encompasses and informs everything. I am part of the Tao. The way this computer is working is part of the Tao. The cat to my right is part of the Tao. This mug is part of the Tao. The way a tree grows, the way an electron moves, the way this watch ticks, all of this is part of the Tao. The Tao is basically the, fl the flow of the universe, how the universe is working or operating. Thus, we can call it God if we want to use Western language, but the Taoists are going to call, are going to think of the Tao or of God as differently, uh, as different than the Christians would. Okay. In Christianity, for example, we have this conception of a God who exists outside of time and space, who created the universe. Um, his, the creation is separate from God and God is now kind of just watching the universe unfold, watching his creation unfold. This is not how the Taoists think of the Tao or the way. Rather, the Tao is at the same time imminent in all of this stuff and transcendent to it at the same time. Whereas in Christianity, we think of God as being separate from nature, and they're two different things. The Tao is, is actually nature. Um, it's the thing that is the origin of nature, of all this stuff. It is the thing that is um, making things change and pushing things to evolve. 
The Tao is all of this stuff. Okay, so there is not really a, a distinction ultimately between the Tao and anything else because everything that we see is part of the Tao. The Tao cannot be defined in words. Uh, it's not an idea or a concept. It can't be categorized because the Tao itself is beyond categorization or understanding. We can't put the Tao in a box. We can't really slap a label on it and understand it because it, it defies categorization. Taoism is going to call the Tao, even though it, it uses the word Tao to refer to it, it's going to call it unnameable. It's going to say it is a mystery. Um, because what that word Tao refers to, or is trying to refer to, is this expansive, mysterious, infinite thing from which the universe is originating, um, the principle by which the universe is organized. Um, it's kind of a strange, uh, mystical concept, very hard for us to wrap our minds around. But perhaps Alan Watts can give us a little bit of instruction here. He talks about the Tao on page 42. Tao cannot be defined in words, and it is not an idea or concept. As Chung Tzu says, it may be attained, but not seen, or in other words, felt, but not conceived, intuited, but not categorized, divined, but not explained. In a similar way, air and water cannot be cut or clutched and their flow ceases when they are enclosed. There is no way of putting a stream in a bucket or the wind in a bag. Verbal description and definition may be compared to the latitude, latitudinal and longitudinal nets which we visualize upon the earth, and the heavens to define and enclose the positions of mountains and lakes, planets and stars. But earth and heaven themselves are not cut by these imaginary lines these significations, these concepts or words that we try to use. As Wittgenstein said, laws, like the laws of causation, treat of the network and not of what the network describes. For the game of Western philosophy and science is to trap the universe in the networks of words and numbers, so that there is always the temptation to confuse the rules or laws of grammar and mathematics with the actual operations of nature. But these things are different, right? How the universe, what the universe is actually like is separate from the words and concepts that we use to uh, explain it or talk about it. We must not, however, overlook the fact that human calculation is also an operation of nature. But just as trees do not represent or symbolize rocks, our thoughts do not necessarily represent trees and rocks. Thoughts grow in brains as grass grows in fields. Any correspondence between them is abstract, as between ten roses and ten stones, which does not take into account the smell and color of the roses or the shapes and structure of the stones. Although thought is in nature, we must not confuse the game rules of thought with the patterns of nature. So what the Taoists are trying to point to using this word, the Tao, is the operations of the universe. But remember, the operations of the universe are independent from the words and the categories and the concepts that we slap onto them, right? Grass is always going to be different. It's going to exceed any uh, idea or concept we have of grass, if that makes sense. The Tao is likewise. This, if by Tao we're trying to point to the operations of the universe, how everything is flowing, how everything is existing, we can't define it in words we can't completely explain it with concepts or categories because it is it is what what is out there 
It's what is out there, but there's never going to be a complete one-to-one -one correspondence between what is out there and the words and the symbols we use to describe that. That's what it's trying to uh, get across here. According to another scholar, to help you understand a little bit of this concept of the Tao, Cohn says the Tao is the underlying cosmic power which creates the universe, supports culture in the state, saves the good and punishes the wicked. Literally, the way, Tao, refers to the way things develop naturally, the way nature moves along and living beings grow and decline in accordance with cosmic laws. So the Tao is meant to signify everything and how things work. That's basically it. It's a strange concept. I know it's hard for us to wrap our heads around. But as we'll see, even this difficulty of discussing the Tao is something that is central to how Taoism is practiced. So, to sum up, Everything is part of the Tao, which is both, it escapes our words and categories, but it, it is also in everything. The Tao is in you, the Tao is in the mug, the Tao is in the coaster, okay? The Tao is in all of this stuff, but the Tao is not exactly equivalent to the coaster, right? The, the Tao exceeds the coaster, because the Tao is, is everything else too, right? So in some ways, the Tao is in everything. Everything is a part of the Tao, but the Tao is more than the sum of its parts. If we took everything in the universe and we grouped it all together, we would still say the Tao is there, but the Tao is also bigger than all that stuff and something more than the set of all that stuff. So we can say in some primitive sense that all is one and uh, one is all that should read according to Taoism. Another idea that we see which is central to Taoist metaphysics is this concept of Li, which is the idea that everything operates only according to its own nature or pattern. How humans work is that humans operate according to human nature. How a tree grows is it operates according to tree nature. What a mug does, what happens to a mug, uh, falls within the operations of mugness or what it is like to be a mug or something like that. The basic idea is like this. Even though everything is all part of the Tao, each particular manifestation of the Tao operates according to its own rules, okay? So the way a wombat lives is not going to be the same way a dolphin lives. How wood grows is not going to be the same way that a uh, fern grows. Basically, each thing that is manifesting in the universe is operating in a sense according to its own pattern, its own Li, like how the grains of wood uh, develop in a piece of wood. And Taoism is going to say, ultimately things cannot be or act other than what they are, right? A dolphin can't be a mug, uh, a human can't be a bomb, so a human shouldn't try to be a bomb. There's a descriptive claim here, and there's a normative claim. There's a claim here that says things can only operate according to their own nature, and also, as humans, we shouldn't try to get things to operate differently than they naturally will. That is basically the idea behind the concept of Li. Although everything is part of the Tao, um, everything kind of, in a sense, operates according to its own rules as well. And so this leads us into a discussion of 
all these kind of metaphysical and mystical concepts are cool, but how exactly does one practice Taoism? With Buddhism, the idea was pretty simple, right? We're caught up in this cycle. This cycle makes us suffer. We want to escape it. So we got to do things to escape it. Well, knowing what we know about Taoism, how do we actually practice it? How do we accord with our nature? How do we um, allow things to go their own way? How can the harmony of the universe be established? Well, the idea is pretty simple. In general, we can say understanding and practicing Taoism is going to require a radical shift in our psychology and the way that we act and the way that we experience the world. Okay, In Western society, the way that we talk about things, the way that we think about things, the way that we act presumes what we might call a subject-object metaphysics. That is, we see various things in our environment as objects, as distinct from us. And furthermore, we make a distinction between subjects, agents, things that have experience, and things that don't. Like, I am a subject, and this mug is an object, right? This is one of the things that has to go if we're going to practice Taoism. Again, Taoism is going to say there actually really isn't a distinction between all these things. All these things are at bottom part of the Tao. And so even though I have experience, me, this mug and I are actually part of the same underlying thing, the Tao. We're not actually separate. We're not separable. In Western society, we also have this uh, attitude or disposition towards attachment, right? We invest ourselves in relationships. We want people to think highly of us. We chase after wealth. We chase after a job or that new car or that new video game. We get so wrapped up, right, in our education, in our jobs, in our relationships. Buddhism and Taoism are trying to get are trying to get us to see that. These attachments are actually holding us back from living a flourishing life. In the case of Buddhism, they're going to say these attachments cause us to suffer. In Taoism, they're going to say these attachments prevent us from actually flowing with the operations of the universe. So we need to detach ourselves from all of this crap which doesn't matter. All of these things that are at bottom draining us and not actually giving us life. Tao is most also going to say we need to give up trying to control and explain everything with words and numbers, trying to explain others' actions or control others' actions, trying to control groups of people. This is not the way to go about it, okay? And it's kind of doomed to failure. When we meddle in things, when we try to uh, put words and labels and concepts on everything and control everything and understand everything, that is actually preventing us from achieving a long-lasting peace and security. As the person who tries to grasp water realizes it just flows through their fingers and doesn't actually get a hold of it, so too is the Taoist going to say, our desire, our need to control and grasp everything is going to actually prevent us from understanding the way the world actually works and moving in accordance with it. Finally, to make uh, one more uh, point, Taoism is going to say we need to stop uh, engaging in these redempt what, I've, what I'm calling redemptive modes of thought, which is to say that human beings are in need of saving, that there's something wrong with them, that there's something wrong with the universe, that this is all uh, bad and needs to be radically transformed. This is kind of the message implied by Christianity, right? When it says that sin has entered the universe and it's entered the earth and it's entered human nature. Taoism is going to say, no, you don't need saving, okay? You are not sinful to the core, 
the universe is not corrupted, the problems that are arising in our world, in our societies, from people trying to control things, from us trying to meddle in things that we don't need to meddle in, if we just allowed everything to go its own way, to operate according to its, its own pattern, its li, we would be able to allow the harmony of the universe to be established. So Taoism is trying to get a, us away from this idea that there's something broken and wrong with us and nature. This is also something Friedrich Nietzsche advocates for in his philosophy. He rails against this idea that humanity is sick and in need of help. Now here is the sticking point. This is what makes teaching Taoism and practicing Taoism very difficult. Living according to the Tao is not something that can be uh, practiced or achieved consciously or intentionally. Because if you're trying to live in accordance with the Tao, you're already missing the mark, right? You should be living according to your own nature, just doing things naturally, not trying to control and plan everything. It's like trying to be cool, right? If you're bringing one friend to hang out with your other group of friends and you're like, yo, be cool, man, just be cool. What's going to happen? If they try to be cool, they're not going to be cool, right? They're going to get anxious. People are going to say, oh, your friend's kind of weird, right? It's the same thing with Taoism. You cannot be a Taoist if you're trying to be a Taoist. You cannot do it consciously. And insofar as Taoism is something that has to be lived, I can't really teach you how to do this either. I can't transfer information in my head to your head that is going to allow you to live like a Taoist. That's not how it works. It's just something you kind of have to achieve naturally on your own. It needs to be personally felt, personally lived in order to be understood, in order for you to live in accordance with the Tao. A great example of what a good Taoist looks like is a cat. You'll see here on the screen I have a picture of my cat Bit. We call her Itty Bitty, Itty Bitty Kitty Committee. Cats are wonderful examples of Taoism. Why? They don't plan anything, right? They don't control anything. They're not trying to understand the world, okay? Cats are just doing cat stuff. When a cat is tired, it goes and lays down and falls asleep. When the cat wants to play, it plays. When the cat wants to watch birds outside the window, that's what it does. The cat is always living according to its own nature, right? The cat is just going to do cat stuff, and it doesn't give a shit about you, about other cats, about other animals. It's going to do what it wants to do, okay? It is allowing itself to be moved by its inner desires, by what nature is inspiring it to do. It's basically how we should be acting as well, okay? We shouldn't try to plan or intentionally do things or understand everything. We should just do what comes naturally to us. This is what Taoism is trying to get us to realize. The wisdom of living like this. And the great success that we can achieve if we live like this. Watts talks about this on pages 88 to 90. This is what he says. In other words, what is ordinarily felt is the wayward, unpredictable, dangerous, and even hostile world, including one's own capricious emotions and inner feelings, is actually one's own being and doing, according to Taoism. The very sense that this is not so is, in turn, part of its being so. Thus, from the standpoint of early contemplative Taoism, any deliberate exercise to cultivate Wu Wei or non-action would seem to be self-contradictory. In Chung Tzu's own metaphor, it would be, quote, beating a drum in search of a fugitive 
Or, as the Chan Buddhists later said, putting legs on a snake. In line with Lao Tzu, one might say, quote, superior non-action, living according to the primary principle of Taoism, does not aim at non-action, and so it truly is non-action. Understanding it is a matter of getting the point intuitively, not a result of some discipline. In the same way, it does not take any schooling to understand the trick of representing a third dimension by lines drawn in perspective. It simply has to be pointed out. And then the experience of depth in the picture is not, is not just verbal comprehension, but actual vision. What then are we to make of the venerable tradition of meditative exercises in Hinduism, Buddhism, Hishen, Taoism, and Islamic Sufism? which make cosmic consciousness or supernormal powers their ostensible goal. If we go ahead to the early Chan writings of the Tang Dynasty, remembering that Chan was then a fusion of Taoism and Buddhism, there can, I think, be no question that such early Chan t teachers as Seng Sun, Hyoneng, Shen Hui, Matsu, or even Lin Qi, not only laid no stress on meditative exercises, pardon my terrible pronunciations, but often dismissed them as irrelevant. Their entire emphasis was upon immediate intuitive insight resulting from the teacher's direct pointing in question and answer interviews called Wen Ta, by means of which one who had seen into the truth of things simply pointed it out to one who had not, often by nonverbal means, by demonstration rather than explanation. It was for this reason that Hui Nang, the sixth patriarch of Chan Buddhism, called his method the Sudden School, now derived by crypto-Protestant Buddhists as instant Zen, like instant coffee, as if the value of an inspiration or intuition must be judged by the merely quantitative standard of the time and energy spent in preparation for it. But how long does it take a child to know that fire is hot? On the other hand, those who understand the Tao delight, just like cats, in just sitting and watching without any goal or result in mind. But when a cat gets tired of sitting, it gets up and goes for a walk or hunts for mice. It does not punish itself or compete with other cats in an endurance test to as to how long it can, it can remain unmovable, unless there is some real reason for being still, such as catching a bird. Contemplative Taoists will happily sit with yogis and Zenists for as long as is reasonable and comfortable, but when nature tells us that we are pushing the river, we will get up and do something else, or even go to sleep. More than this is certainly spiritual pride. Taoists do not look upon meditation as a practice, except in the sense that a doctor practices medicine. They have no design to subjugate or alter the universe by force or willpower, for their art is entirely to go along with the flow of things in an intelligent way. Meditation or contemplation, Quan, develops this intelligence as a byproduct, not as a direct objective. The objective or good of contemplation is only that, during a long night, the sound of the water says what I think. His mind is free from all thoughts. His demeanor is still and silent. His forehead beams with simplicity. He is cold as autumn and warm as spring. For his joy and anger occur as naturally as the four seasons. So, if one is going to follow Taoism, if one is going to practice it, it's just something that has to be done naturally. You can't try to do it. Just like you can't try to be cool and succeed at being cool. Okay? It just has to flow naturally from you. It involves intelligently understanding and following the operations of the universe so that one acts only when one has to. Instead of trying to control and plan out and bring about a certain objective or a certain event. To this end, 
Practicing Taoism involves what is called Wu Wei, which is mentioned by Watts in the passage. What we can translate literally as non-action or effortless action. This is not uh, staying still all the time and being lazy. It's not not moving ever and just sitting on the couch for the rest of your life. It's not mere passivity. Rather, it means not to force or meddle in things. It means to intelligently just act naturally. Just do things, doing things that comes nat come naturally to you. If you're tired, you lay down and you sleep. That's Wu Wei. If you're hungry, you eat. That's Wu Wei. Rather than trying to intermittent fast to lose weight, rather than trying to force yourself to fall asleep at a good time, these things are not Wu Wei. These are forcing or meddling in things. Watts expands upon this. The Tao does nothing, and yet nothing is left undone. These famous words of Lao Tzu obviously cannot be taken in their literal sense. For the principle of non-action, Wu Wei, is not to be considered inertia, laziness, laissez-faire, or mere passivity. Among the several meanings of Wei are to be, to do, to make, to practice, to act out. And in the first part, it means false, simulated, counterfeit. But in the context of Taoist writings, it quite clearly means forcing, meddling, and artifice. In other words, trying to act against the grain of Li. Thus, Wu Wei as not forcing is what we mean by going with the grain, rolling with the punch, swimming with the current, trimming sails to the wind, taking the tide at its flood, and stooping to conquer. It is perhaps best exemplified in the Japanese arts of Judo and Aikido, where an opponent is defeated by the force of his own attack, and the latter art reaches such heights of skill that I have seen an attacker thrown to the floor without even being touched. This is why I have a picture of a Judo throw here. Somebody who knows judo well and practices it well does not try to lift somebody up and throw them on the ground. Rather, they use the force, the energy of their opponent approaching them against them. So if somebody rushes at you, if you just act intelligently and move a certain way, you can flip them on the ground. Right? You don't need to forcibly pick them up and throw them. It's much easier to use their own energy or force against them to achieve your desired end. That is a prime example of Wu Wei. Acting intelligently when necessary, going with the flow of things, but not trying to force or meddle. That is what is meant here. The principle is illustrated by the parable of the pine and the willow in heavy snow. The pine branch, being rigid, cracks under the weight, but the willow branch yields to the weight and the snow drops off. Note, however, that the willow is not limp, but springy. Wu Wei is thus the lifestyle of one who follows the Tao, and must be understood primarily as a form of intelligence. That is, of knowing the principles, structures, and trends of human and natural affairs so well that one uses the least amount of energy in dealing with them. But this intelligence is, as we have seen, not simply intellectual. It is also the unconscious intelligence of the whole organism, and in particular, the innate wisdom of the nervous system. Wu Wei is a combination of this wisdom with taking the line of least resistance in all one's actions. It is not the mere avoidance of effort. In Judo, for example, one uses muscle, but only at the right moment, when the opponent is off balance or has overextended himself. But even this effort has a peculiarly unforced quality, which is called Qi, roughly equivalent to the Sanskrit prana, an energy associated with breath. This may be illustrated by the Aikido exercise of the unbendable arm. The right arm is extended to the front and the opponent is invited to bend it. If the arm is held rigidly, 
a strong opponent will certainly bend it. If, on the other hand, it is held out easily, with the eyes fixed on a distant point, and with the feeling that it is a rubber hose through which water is flowing towards the point, it will be extremely difficult to bend. Without straining, one simply assumes that the arm will stay straight, come what may, because of the flow of chi. During the test, breathe out slowly as if from the belly, and think of the breath as moving through the arm. This is perhaps a form of what we call, or rather miscall, self-hypnosis, which has nothing to do with sleep. I have found that something of the same kind can be used in opening a stiff cap on a jar, and I knew an old Zen master, frail in appearance, who, seemingly by leaning against boulders, moved them, which defeated stronger, younger men. Just as water follows gravity, and if trapped, rises to find a new outlet, so Wu Wei is that principle that gravity is energy, and the Taoist finds in gravity a constant stream which may be used in the same way as the wind or a current. Falling with gravity constitutes the immense energy of the earth spinning in its orbit around the sun. Thus, what it means to practice Taoism is living in a sense in the present, flowing with the operations of the universe, using the energy of the universe uh, by acting just at the appropriate time, taking the line of least resistance uh, so that one can use the energy that they are flowing with to great effect. It is not consciously or intentionally trying to do things. It's just going with the flow, doing things that come naturally based on an intuitive understanding of the operations of the universe. And so Taoism cannot be taught. It is not a discipline. It's not something that I can explain to you. It's something that ultimately has to be lived. Okay. I'd like to go over just one more thing in this lecture. And that is just a brief glimpse uh, at the primary text that we're going to be reading concerning Taoism. The Tao Te Ching. The Tao Te Ching is a collection of Taoist sayings, uh, we might call them nuggets of wisdom, regarding how to live in accordance with the Tao, how to live in accordance with the flow of the universe. You'll see as you read that this is a very difficult text. Uh, it contains a lot of mysterious, uh, paradoxical, and contradictory sayings. So you're going to have to do some work to try to figure out what exactly is being expressed here. How do these things fit together? I think personally that these really short sayings are meant to induce a certain psychological change in the reader, kind of an aha moment such that when you realize what the passage is trying to get at, it pushes you towards uh, a life experience and a way of acting that is more in accordance with this thing that these sages are calling the Tao. It's poetic. Uh, it's meditative in character. Um, on the face, the words appear very simple, but it's very strange because as you dig into it, you come to realize that these ideas are very deep. But if you dig deeper, you realize that actually there is a, an extreme simplicity to this way of thinking and this way of being. So, uh, Read the Tao Te Ching for next week. Um, of course, if you have any questions, feel free to email me or uh, post in the discussion boards, whatever you want to do. I'm really excited to see what y'all think of this Asian philosophy and of this text. And I'm looking forward to exploring it with you next week. Okay, that's all I have for you today. Uh, thanks again, and I hope you have a wonderful week. See you next time.